Hello and welcome. I'm Rosanna Lockwood. You're watching W News, broadcasting live from the Al Arabiya headquarters. These are our top stories. In another intense day of strikes on Lebanon, Israel claims to have killed another senior Hezbollah commander in southern Beirut. The UN saying two of its refugee agency staff members were among at least 558 people killed by Israel's bombing across Lebanon on Monday. Israel's Prime Minister has issued a statement on social media telling the Lebanese people, quote, the war is not with them, but with Hezbollah. And Joe Biden says full-scale war is not in anyone's interest, addressing the UN General Assembly for his last time as US President. Well, Israel's military claiming to have killed another senior Hezbollah commander today in a strike on southern Beirut. This time, the head of the group's rocket and missile division, Ibrahim Kubaisi. Israel also claiming other senior officials were in the apartment of the residential building that was hit, with more pictures and details of that strike in a crowded residential area of Beirut still emerging. Well, to discuss this further, I'm joined in the studio by a military expert and consultant to Al Arabian Network, Riyadh Hawaji. So good to see you again. Look, uh, let's talk about uh, this claim from Israel. How likely is it that Israel have indeed killed Ibrahim Kubaisi? And what do we know about who he is? What well, we've seen Israel um, target successfully with precision uh, many Hezbollah commanders over the past year. Mm. And this is clear indication of an intelligence failure on the part of Hezbollah. And that the Israelis, in so many ways, uh, either electronically or through human intelligence, have built a good database and have developed a strong awareness of the uh, determining the whereabouts of these commanders and targeting them in real time, as we saw today. And there was another attempt even the day before. It did not succeed. The guy was, uh, um, by the name of Ali Karaki, was injured. Uh, but still, uh, it counts as a, they knew where the guy is, but you know, the, uh, um, the targeting did not succeed as it was in the case, today's case. The question that presents itself is, how Hezbollah is going to be managing if we see a repeated assassinations on a daily basis uh, for the next few weeks. Um, already, the top commanders, uh, like Fuad Shukur, um, then we saw uh, the uh, um, um, other commanders uh, like uh, Tawil, like Wehbi, uh, um, of that level have been eliminated. Um, and um, Ibrahim Akhil, um, who's going to be running this organization? Mm. What, what, how is it going to affect its operations on the ground? Definitely, it is devastating to the morale of uh, Hezbollah uh, because it is now feeling the leadership insecure, even the uh, uh, regular. Uh, soldiers on the ground will be feeling insecure. Uh, there's strong doubts about Hezbollah's intelligence, security, uh, protective security, and so forth. Uh, so um, altogether, uh, this is a win for Israel, and it is an indication that Israel has done its homework uh, effectively and successfully, leading to this showdown that is unfolding uh, in, in Lebanon uh, between Israel and Hezbollah. In, in terms of the scale of the bombardment by Israel over Lebanon today, Israel's Air Force putting out a statement or, or saying on, on social media they've dropped around 2,000 weapons in the last 24 hours over Lebanon. In your military experience, how heavy is that in terms of bombardment? This is a very intense bombardment. Uh, it even, in some cases, exceed what we saw in the whole 33 days of the 2006 Second Lebanon War. Mm. Uh, so far, it exceeded that intensity. Uh, the number of casualties 
is half of what fell in 33 days in Lebanon. This is just in one day. Mm. Uh, so uh, this reflects the intensity, the wide scale uh, of these uh, attacks um, and the impact uh, on the population, you know, the civilian, and as well as on the uh, Hezbollah fighters, Hezbollah's uh, a popular base. Uh, uh, so all together, um, the Israeli campaign, air campaign, is massive by all means. And according to the Israeli leadership, they, the intention is to continue at the same scale. For how long? I mean, the question here is this, is it going to continue for a week, two, three, a month, two? Uh, there was a lot of talk by experts, analysts, uh, saying that you know, the period leading to the US a presidential election is a, a time for uh, Netanyahu to, to play with, to mm. uh, experiment, to carry out uh, his schemes. So does this mean we're gonna, for the next two months, we're gonna see uh, uh, this level of intense uh, daily attacks and how devastative will this be on Hezbollah, but also on the Lebanese uh, population and knowing Lebanon being in the, the state of disarray uh, because of its ac acute economic situation and internal political divisions. And what will also be, of course, on the minds of Lebanese citizens regarding if it continues is how targeted these strikes are going to be. Israel's authority saying these are targeted strikes, targeted at certain Hezbollah commanders, but others saying they're not as targeted as you would hope, given the amount of civilian casualties. Of course, of course. You know, they are hitting uh, civilian areas as well. It is not just uh, Hezbollah's uh, uh, bases. Israel saying that Hezbollah's bases, command and control, and so forth, are in populated civilian areas. Therefore, Israel is in advance justifying the targeting of civilian areas. And we're seeing the results. We have uh, huge, uh, the toll on the population, the civilian population, is already high, mm -hmm. and it is expected to increase. Uh, um, now, um, and, and, the, and the laws of war, this is not acceptable. Uh, uh, engaging uh, even a military target in a, a civilian area uh, is not sanctioned, under, uh, especially under the Western doctrine, military doctrine. Uh, you know, when, you, when uh, a pilot uh, sees civilians in close proximity of a target, they don't carry out the strike because pr priority is to spare civilian lives and to try to separate the combatants from non-combatants and only concentrate on the combatants. We're not seeing this. We haven't seen this exercise by Israel in Gaza and uh, we are not expecting to see uh, uh, any, any difference uh, in Israel. Uh, in, in Lebanon right now, you know, Israelis, uh, can say, can justify as much as possible, but the facts on the ground uh, speak for themselves. In, in terms of uh, Hezbollah's command structure and the way um, they store their weapons around Lebanon, uh, because they do fire rockets, of course, into, into Israel, Netanyahu warning in a statement earlier that Hezbollah allies, that anyone who has a missile in their living room and a rocket in their garage will not have a home. Is that an accurate description of the way Hezbollah store their weapons? Well, we saw the videos by, uh, released by the Israeli uh, spokesman. Uh, we also saw on the social media uh, um, a good number of videos showing uh, what appears to be uh, arms depots going up in flames, you know, uh, missiles uh, sh shooting out of this uh, uh, depot that is in flames. Uh, these are in between houses, in between buildings. It seems to be underground, uh, under, uh, in the basements of buildings. Uh, so, has Hezbollah stored such weapons in civilian areas under buildings? Yes. Is there evidence? Yes. We have seen this uh, um, substantiated uh, several times. But does this mean that every target being hit by Israel 
is an actual Hezbollah target, not likely, and there is no evidence proving that every target was a Hezbollah target. And we've seen, since we have a lot of civilian casualties, uh, um, you know, along the way, uh, this also supports the theory that there are quite a good number of non-military targets that are being uh, uh, hit at the, same, at the same time during these strikes. Military expert and consultant to Al Arabian Network, Riyad Hawaji. Thank you. Thank you. Well, let's get some more on the situation on the ground in Beirut now with journalist Rawad Taha. Uh, just talk to us very simply to begin with, Rawad, if you wouldn't mind, about what things are like in Beirut this evening. What, do, what does it feel like being there? Definitely the country has been uh, facing an unprecedented uh, time of uh, uncertainty, in particular the southern part of uh, Lebanon and Beirut, and in particular its southern uh, suburb. Uh, today's, uh, today's Beirut started with a massive uh, traffic jam, uh, jam from those who were uh, flee, uh, fleeing southern Lebanon. We're talking about thousands, uh, uh, tens of thousands of people. According to the latest data that uh, I have received, uh, over 20,000 uh, uh, internally displaced uh, uh, people have been registered. And we're talking here only in uh, shelters which were, uh, which were available uh, by uh, by the government, so mostly in uh, public schools across different areas on, uh, of Lebanon. However, the total number of those displaced could uh, easily be estimated at around at least 100,000 people who uh, fled southern Lebanon over the past uh, 24 hours. Uh, in terms of uh, Beirut, uh, things have been uh, in general calm, except for uh, an airstrike earlier this afternoon on Beirut's uh, southern uh, suburb, uh, the assassination of uh, Hezbollah uh, military uh, officer. Uh, he is supposedly responsible for uh, Hezbollah's uh, uh, rocket uh, launching uh, unit. Uh, that airstrike in particular led to the killing of uh, six people, including uh, two confirmed uh, Hezbollah uh, personnel, one of which is uh, Brahim uh, uh, Kubaisi. So uh, this is the confirmed name of the Hezbollah uh, commander who was assassinated uh, this afternoon in Beirut's uh, southern uh, suburb. Uh, along with uh, his uh, assistant and a number of other uh, people. That airstrike as well on Beirut's southern suburb uh, led to 15 uh, injuries in total. And this is according to preliminary information by the Ministry of Health. If you want to also have a wrap up on uh, yesterday's round of severe airstrikes across southern Lebanon, uh, which you were discussing uh, with uh, your guest, the total as of now for yesterday's uh, at all is uh, 558 uh, dead, including uh, 50 children and 94 women. The total number of injuries for uh, yesterday's airstrike, that is Monday, September 23rd, is 1,835. And again, this is the official data by the Ministry of Health, uh, including uh, roughly around uh, seven uh, paramedics. Uh, the number of hospitals which have received those injuries uh, is estimated to be 54 uh, hospitals across different parts of uh, southern Lebanon and Beirut as well. Thank you for that wrap of information, Roa. Can I just ask you what it's like uh, being there? I mean, do you, uh, you're a journalist, you're used to covering the region, obviously, uh, being based in Lebanon. Um, you said it was fairly calm in Beirut itself. Is there a sense of concern about what might happen tonight or over coming days? The sense of uh, concern is uh, very real, uh, and it is targeting every other uh, Lebanese uh, person or individual. So, yes, I think the word is uh, uncertainty. Uh, while, in fact, we saw that uh, the past 48 hours have brought a great escalation to this, in, uh, to this ongoing uh, war of attrition that has been going on between uh, Hezbollah and Israel for almost the past year or the past 11 months, uh, the past 48 hours are looking more like some sort of a uh, real war. Uh, even the entire hospital uh, hospitalization sector in Lebanon and the public health services have been uh, overwhelmed this past week. And this is uh, just uh, the beginning of what could be uh, eventually uh, worse. So there's a lot of uncertainty of what's happening. Uh, thousands of uh, refugees and internally displaced people across Lebanon. Uh, there is great fear and concern uh, that this uh, last wave of escalation is actually the start of another major a war if things are not uh, contained diplomatically within the next few days. 
Indeed, and, and Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu in a statement this afternoon to the Lebanese people, to you all in Lebanon, saying that the attacks, the bombardment of the last few days, he said they're not aimed at Lebanese people, they're aimed at Hezbollah. Um, how was that received by Lebanese people? Look, uh, in particular, uh, the data is clear. The data that we just mentioned uh, shows a significant number of casualties among women and children. Uh, indeed, a lot of what has been attacked over the past 48 hours is Hezbollah infrastructure. Uh, but uh, uh, in particular, uh, Monday was a very different day. So uh, the Lebanese people, and in particular the people of southern Lebanon, woke up to messages uh, on their phones, uh, to calls on their landlines by the Israeli army, uh, calling for evacuation, calling for those uh, who live around Hezbollah infrastructure to leave. Now the question is, uh, do people always know that they live around Hezbollah infrastructure? That's the first question that we need to ask. Second of all, was there enough time given before the raids were launched? Also, that is a legitimate question because uh, the text messages were sent roughly around 8.30 a.m. in the morning. Uh, the heavy shelling, which targeted the centers of towns and villages, started around uh, noon. So, uh, in particular, uh, I think your guest already mentioned it just a moment ago. Uh, was there a lot of infrastructure for Hezbollah that was damaged? The answer is definitely yes. Did all those who fell and were killed yesterday, Hezbollah members and commanders, the answer is also definitely not. So a lot of bypassers, a lot of civilians were hurt massively from yesterday's round of airstrikes, especially since the number of hours given for people to evacuate was very limited. Beirut-based journalist Rawad Taha, thank you very much for your time. Well, in just the last few hours, Israel's Prime Minister, as we were discussing there, Benjamin Netanyahu, has issued a statement on social media to neighbouring Lebanese citizens telling them that the war is, quote, not with you, our war is with Hezbollah. I have a message for the people of Lebanon. Israel's war is not with you. It's with Hezbollah. For too long, Hezbollah has been using you as human shields. It placed rockets in your living rooms, and missiles in your garage. Those rockets and missiles are aimed directly at our cities, directly at our citizens. To defend our people against Hezbollah strikes, we must take out those weapons. Now, starting this morning, the IDF has warned you to get out of harm's way. I urge you, take this warning seriously. Don't let Hezbollah endanger your lives and the lives of your loved ones. Don't let Hezbollah endanger Lebanon. Please. Get out of harm's way now. Once our operation is finished, you can come back safely to your homes. Well, for more on that, I'm joined now from Tel Aviv by our correspondent there, Sarah Coates. And Sarah, tell us more about what Netanyahu said in that social media statement. Hi there, Rosanna. He is vowing to hurt Hezbollah. He says that... He who has a rocket in his living room will not have a home. Now, this statement from Netanyahu came just hours after the Israeli military released pictures of what it says were long-range rocket launchers hidden in the home of a Lebanese family, with the IDF saying that this is evidence that Hezbollah is putting munitions in homes belonging to civilians. Now, also today, the Defence Minister, Yoav Gallant, he took part in a drilling exercise in the north of Israel where troops are preparing for a plan to potentially go into Lebanon. And what we heard from the Defence Minister there, he said, we are crushing what was built by Hezbollah over 20 years. And this statement from Yoav Gallant that came just hours after the IDF carried out yet another targeted strike on the southern suburbs of Beirut, claiming this time that they have killed the head of the munitions uh, part of Hezbollah, and that is uh, uh, Kubasi, that is Ibrahim Kubasi. So certainly uh, what we're seeing here from the Israelis is a lot of confidence, a lot of rhetoric claiming that they are basically carrying out this escalation in Lebanon uh, for, uh, to get rid of these weapons that they claim are hidden in civilian homes by Hezbollah. But certainly uh, when you look at the figures on the ground uh, with regards to the death toll, with, with regards to the injuries, this is extremely concerning.
Yeah, I was going to ask, is that confidence that you mentioned there amongst the Israeli government figures, is that being reflected amongst the Israeli public? Do they feel that sense of confidence about what's happening? Well, this is really a public that is deeply divided. On one hand, Netanyahu's base, uh, they will receive this message very well. But then on the other hand, there are people who just basically say this is typical Netanyahu. He's trying to divert attention away from other issues that he should be addressing. We need to remember what's being seen on the ground uh, for the past 11 months, and that is demonstrations growing by the week for people calling for an immediate ceasefire, people calling for the immediate release of these hostages that do remain in the Gaza Strip. So, of course, anyone that opposes Netanyahu will come out to say that he's trying to draw attention away from these actual issues. And when you look at Netanyahu's stated war goals that he put out about a year ago, this was bringing the hostages home, completely defeating Hamas and ensuring that Hamas never poses a threat to anyone in Israel again. And what you're really seeing on the ground after 11 months of fighting in Gaza is none of these objectives achieved. There are still hostages in Gaza. There are still rockets often being fired from the Gaza Strip toward Israeli territory. And Hamas certainly has not been defeated. And now it was just a couple of weeks ago that Netanyahu added this new war goal, this expanded war goal, and that is to return these northern residents, these 60,000 people who were internally displaced in Israel, home. So certainly uh, there will be a lot of criticism over this uh, recent ex-post of Benjamin Netanyahu uh, vowing to crush Hezbollah. But certainly uh, he's really speaking to his base there. But just to also bring in uh, a few stats, uh, recent polls show that Netanyahu and his right-wing coalition, uh, they're really beginning to recover from this post-October 7 slump. They're gaining once again in the polls. But if elections were to be held today, they still wouldn't have the majority of seats. They'd have some 24 seats. Uh, so certainly not enough uh, to regain power. But in saying that, the next set of elections won't be held till 2026. Really interesting stuff. Uh, thank you, Sarah Coates, correspondent there in Tel Aviv. Well, amid criticism, military action has been prioritised. Israel's ambassador to the UN, Danny Danon, speaking to Al Arabiya News, claiming otherwise. We were very patient. You know, we, we waited for diplomacy to bring results, and we still prefer diplomacy. You know, I approached uh, the Minister of Foreign Affairs uh, of Lebanon last Friday in the Security Council of the United Nations, and I told him, you know we can achieve very easily agreements about everything. We have no conflict with Lebanon, but the problem is that Hezbollah took over Lebanon, and they are using Lebanon as a launching pad. So we waited for diplomacy. We still hope that there will be an opening for diplomacy. But at the same time, we intend to take the required actions in order to stop the situation where you have major parts of Israel under fire every day. I think any other country will do the same. Well, for more reaction to the situation, I'm joined by the former U.S. Deputy Special Envoy to monitor and combat anti-Semitism, Eli Kohanim. Thank you very much for making time. And, and look, let's start by getting your reaction to those comments by Israel's ambassador to the U.N., Danny Danon, speaking to us at Al Arabiya News earlier today, saying that they waited for diplomacy to work Israel, but it hasn't worked. So they've had to take this military course of action. What do you say to that? Well, I would say that your reportage today is missing one element, and that is the role of the Islamic Republic of Iran, which, uh, as your audience knows, funds and trains Hezbollah, the Houthis, Hamas, Kataib Hezbollah, and numerous other terrorist entities across the Middle East and North Africa. And so what we're seeing unfold before our eyes is something that um, I, as someone who was born in Iran myself and have personal experience with the Islamic Republic regime is their disdain for Arabs and their disdain as Shiites for Sunnis. And so the way that the Islamic Republic regime works is that they are using the Arab populations of Lebanon, of Gaza, and these other countries as cannon fodder. They are using Arabs to push forward their own Islamic Republic of Iran agenda, which is to achieve regional hegemony throughout the Middle East. And so my hope is that the Arab people will reject 
this Iranian influence that has taken over their countries, and uh, they'll reject in Lebanon. I hope that the Lebanese will reject Hezbollah. We're seeing the um, Christian populations who are not allowing Hezbollah to come into their towns. We're seeing the Druze do that. And again, I really hope that the Lebanese population will reject Hezbollah and try to save their country from this uh, Iranian terrorist proxy. I want to come and talk to you then some more about uh, Iran's new president's trip to the US. But before doing that, I just want to press you on that point about Israel saying they waited for diplomacy to work. They tried those diplomatic routes and they felt they hadn't. What do you say to that? Well, I mean, it's exactly right. You know, since October 7th, Hezbollah has been launching almost daily missile and rocket attacks on the Israeli civilian population. And the Israelis have been very methodical. They um, first took care of the Hamas threat in Gaza, and now they are finally, after giving diplomacy almost one year, they are turning their attention to the Hezbollah threat in the north. And so I think the Israelis have exhibited incredible patience. They've allowed the Biden administration They've allowed the French and other international parties to uh, to have diplomatic efforts with Hezbollah. The reality, though, is that you're talking about a terrorist group. Hezbollah has been designated as such by the United States, by Western powers, by Europeans and others. And again, they are funded and trained by the Islamic Republic of Iran. So I think the harsh reality and the lesson here is that it's impossible to achieve diplomacy with terror groups. Let's talk then about the Islamic Republic of Iran. Uh, given your expertise on the topic, the new president, Masoud Pazeshkian, um, visiting the US, speaking to media outlets there, some of his words. Um, he's talking about Iran avoiding being dragged into acting in a way that is not worthy of it, saying that Israel is fanning the flames of war in the Middle East and is armed to the teeth and has wep access to weapon systems that are far superior to anything else. What did you make about those comments? Pazeshkin's remarks are laughable because the Islamic Republic of Iran's regime would have the world believe that they are kind of innocent bystanders when we know that they are achieving every day they are attempting to achieve regional hegemony throughout the Middle East. And when you look at how the region is right now in flames, what we see is that all roads lead back to Tehran. And so again, when you're looking at the Houthis, which threaten all of their Arab neighbors, whether it's the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, the Emiratis, and have right now caused uh, international disorder in the Red Seas. Well, the Houthis are now funded and trained by Islamic Republic of Iran. They are an Iranian proxy. The same right now with Hezbollah in Lebanon the same with Hamas in Gaza, the same with Kataib Hezbollah in Iraq. All, all of the disorder, all of the terrorism, all of the innocent lives murdered, all of this blood that is spilled daily in the region, all of this traces back to the Islamic Republic of Iran. And so again, Pazeshkian's remarks are laughable. Uh, it is really up to the international community to hold the Islamic Republic responsible and accountable for all of the bloodshed in this region. And, and just while we've got you, um, given that you're speaking to us out of Washington, D.C., and we've had the UN General Assembly happening there today, Joe Biden speaking to them for the last time as U.S. president, what did you make about Joe Biden's remarks to Unger today, saying that nobody wants this escalation of war? Do you think it was strong enough? It's, it's kind of um, hard, I would say, to uh, judge Joe Biden right now. He's an elderly U.S. president. He's a lame duck right now. We know that um, whoever wins this next election, Joe Biden is out of office. Um, his remarks, however, I think were off key in the sense that um, he was putting a lot of uh, focus, let's just say, on on Israel, sorry for my tech glitch, on Israel and um, and trying to achieve a so-called ceasefire in Gaza with Hamas at a time when we know that Hamas is still holding American and Israeli uh, citizens hostage and at a time when we're seeing ongoing escalation from Hezbollah in the north with Israel. And so his remarks are just off key. What Biden would have been better off doing is putting more pressure on the Islamic Republic of Iran and really calling out the terrorists. That is the only pathway to peace right now in the region. Yesterday, I spoke to Elliot Abrams, who was previously in charge of that sort of maximum pressure campaign against Iran when it came from the U.S. kind of administrations, Ronald Reagan, George W. Bush. He was talking about there not having been such strength since. Do you agree with that? 
Yeah, absolutely. And listen, let us not forget President Donald Trump, who uh, the maximum pressure campaign was launched under his leadership. President Trump has said over and over again that should he win in November, he's, he will be holding the Islamic Republic regime accountable. We have no doubt that uh, maximum pressure sanctions will be placed again on the Islamic Republic. And, uh, and I think that all options would be on the table with a Trump presidency. In terms of the way that, if we just return for a moment to Israel and the way that they handle things uh, from here, there are concerns there's going to be more waves of bombardment over the coming days uh, across Lebanon. Uh, how, how do you expect Netanyahu to explain this, given that there is a war being fought on almost two fronts at the moment by Israel? Well, you have to understand from the Israeli perspective, there's over 70,000 Israelis who are internally displaced, people who live in the north of the country, and they've been, uh, again, under attack um, since October 7th, a daily barrage coming from Hezbollah in the north. And uh, so these Israelis are living in other parts of the country. They need to get back home. Um, I have been in those communities myself. I've been to Israel two times since the war has started. I've seen the devastation. Entire communities in the north have been burnt to ashes. Uh, people's homes have been destroyed. These children are going to schools in other parts of the country. Parents who should be employed or unemployed employed again because they are dislocated and so the israelis have been given almost one year for diplomacy to work with hezbollah they have been left with no choice at this point and as you reported earlier we've seen the israeli army do what no other army in the world does which is to give the uh citizens of lebanon fair warning that they should move that they should uh get out of harm's way again this is no no other army in the world does this and uh, and lastly, you know, I think that um, those citizens of Lebanon who have been living in Hezbollah controlled areas, none of this can be a surprise to them. They know where Hezbollah is located. They've sat there and lived among Hezbollah for almost one year. In reality, these folks had about a year to move themselves out of Hezbollah areas and they didn't do it until now. Uh, providing a different perspective on the events that are happening in Lebanon this evening. We appreciate your expertise on Iran as well. Eli Kohanim, thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. Well, let's get a reminder of tonight's headlines. Israel saying it has killed another senior Hezbollah commander in southern Beirut after another intense day of strikes on Lebanon. The UN saying two of its refugee agency staff members were among at least 558 killed by Israel's bombing across Lebanon on Monday. Israel's Prime Minister has issued a statement on social media telling the Lebanese people the war is not with them but with Hezbollah. And Joe Biden has said full-scale war is not in anyone's interest addressing the UN General Assembly for his last time as the US President. That is all we have time for. Coming up next is Riz Khan's special on the popularity of Zempic. And at 1.30 p.m. Eastern Time, join Tom Burgess-Watson for Global News Today with special guest former U.S. Ambassador to Israel and Jordan, Thomas Pickering, and Lebanese MP Mark Dow.